Who here remembers Blockbuster Video? Rest in peace. Now, Blockbuster, when you would walk in, was filled with walls upon walls of thousands of movies, organized logically, right? By genre, by rating, by release date. I remember spending so much time in that store, just flipping over the movie, reading the trailer text, and hopefully when I got home, it was as good as I thought it would be. Um, but not always. So the thing is, when you went back to Blockbuster, the company didn't know anything new about you other than you had rented movies. Most importantly, it didn't know what you liked or what you didn't like. Contrast that with Netflix. Who here knows Netflix? <laughs> Let's say you're like me and you watch episode one of House of Cards. When you complete that, you go and see a thousand recommendations, not organized by genre, by title, by release date, but by things that you're probably going to like because you watched House of Cards. Do this again and again, watch more and more, the recommendations become better and better because Netflix cares to get to know you and what you like and don't like. So the recommendations it makes are always getting better. Your experience, therefore, is better. This is the power of data. I'm here today to tell you how this is being used in a completely different world, not online, but in our public urban parks. Parks that use technology and data are called smart parks. They do this in a way that is responsible. They do this in a way that focuses on us as individuals using parks to get to know us better, how we use parks, what brings us there, and what brings us back again and again. When parks are made smart and technology and data is used in a productive way, not only does a park get used more, but it lets us as designers, as managers, as agencies who are working on making parks great, actually be able to communicate their value back to citizens, decision makers in cities, and people that have money to invest in them. My background is in urban design and landscape architecture. I spent many years in the beginning of my career working on park designs or community master plans, but what is always confusing to me is that most of the projects I worked on, especially when it was related to parks, were parks that were just underutilized and needed to be redesigned. So now, how many times does that happen to our parks all around our cities? They are designed for a point in time, and then in the future, they are redesigned and again and again. I spent the past three and a half years at a startup at the MIT Media Lab where we are working with cities and parks departments to use technology and data to change this, to change the way that parks are designed so that we're not coming in as landscape architects and urban designers to change something that was just not working. We're doing this in real time to make parks more like Netflix because they understand how they're being used so we don't get to the point of being vacant and underutilized. My ask for all of you today, because I know there's a lot of folks in the room who are working on parks and who might have a perspective on technology that is maybe not so friendly, that parks should be separate from technology. My ask is to think differently about how technology and data can make parks better and used more. So I'm going to share three stories today of different parks all around the country in different settings who are using technology in many different ways to achieve the same outcome, which is to bring people into parks. To me, smart parks have three main principles. They are programmed dynamically so that they create unique experiences. You come back again and again for something new. They are physically designed in a way that lets this happen. So let's say we go to a park on a Friday night and we attend a festival. Maybe it's a food truck rodeo. Maybe it's a beer garden. We can go back to that same park on Saturday morning and happen to walk through a storytelling event for kids or yoga in the park. The key here is that space can accommodate both of those without any structural changes. Number three, these are all based on data. The uses that I just mentioned, those were done because that's what data said is the best use of the park at that time for a certain type of people. To do this, it requires moving away from an idea of designing parks statically, as I mentioned, my background, doing this so much in, in the past, to making them more dynamic and changing based on what people are using them for, and first of all, getting to know how they're being used to make them something that is constantly offering something for everyone. So that means in the morning, a park might be different than it is at night. This is an example from Philadelphia. What we're looking at here is the Eakins Oval. In the back of the photo, you can see Center City, Philadelphia. And then behind where I'm standing, you would see the world-famous Philly Art Museum where Rocky runs up the stairs in the movie. Most of the year, this is just a vacant parking lot. It's a pass-through from Center City to the museum. 
But for a few months, the past five summers, it has transformed into an amazing, dynamic smart park. It does this by doing three main things. It offers contemporary and relevant programming. It measures how people actually use that programming. How many are coming out for things like a children's storytelling event? How many are coming out for yoga? And it takes all of this and it uses the data to say, this is what's working, this is what's not, this is what we should do more of, and here's why. So I'm proud to say that it has returned again for season number six. Summer six at the Oval is going live next year, or next month. So what is dynamic programming? What does that mean? Well, this is amazing. So at the Oval last year, every hour of the day from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. was programmed, seven days a week. Rarely do you see that in a public urban park. They themed it so that you would go to things like Game Day Saturdays, you would go to DJ Dance Party Thursdays, and Wellness Wednesdays, trying to create something for everyone so that the park extends its reach and serves more people. It measures all of this. And now, when we think about technology, it doesn't have to be super sophisticated. It could be going out and counting by hand. It's about getting data. But it could also be things like our benches. So we have a sensor inside of here. They're located in different locations in the park that are most strategic, so at the main entry points or around the amenity areas. We can do things like look at the average length of stay, and this is all with sensor data. So it doesn't require anybody going out and counting by hand, but this data then that comes back is super valuable because you can start to make decisions based on it. So we can see how long somebody stays on average. We can point out events, like the beer garden that happens at happy hour every Friday afternoon. It brings people in for a super long time, but beer does that. But does it do that every day of the weekend? Well, you can look at some data and you can say, well, maybe not. So Friday, it brings a ton of people in, and they stay for a long time. That's the pretty blue on this graph. But when you look on Saturday and Sunday, less people come, and they stay for less time. So what this lets the team do is actually make decisions about, is the beer garden the best use of that space? Could it be better if we paired it with something else? Are people just using different parts of the park because there's other programming there that they care more about than beer? Maybe, maybe not. But by having this data, we can actually test things and then measure their effectiveness in real time, or near real time, to ultimately create experiences that are lively, that are dynamic, that are bringing lots of different people together, all in the same space. This is a smart park. In the county of Los Angeles, there is a huge problem, and that is that during the summer months, when schools are out and budget for school, for programs for kids are being cut, crime rates are skyrocketing. And where does this happen? Where does this start? Largely in the city's parks. And the reason is they're underutilized, they're perceived as not safe, they are home to where gangs hang out. So what's the solution to this? This happens all over our country in our urban areas, in our neighborhoods. The county parks department did something quite simple in concept. They put light in the parks. Well, that's a good starting point. And then they programmed it with amazing programming that brought out all different types of people, different cultures, different races, different ages, things like dance parties, festivals, they enliven these parks and turn them from vacant and scary into fun and community-based. This is important. This data shows the impact of doing this in just three parks. In three parks, the neighborhood crime rates that were programmed with Parks After Dark dropped by 32%. 32%! That's pretty amazing. When you compare it to the parks that were not, crime rates in those neighborhoods rose by 18%. Now, what do you do with this? When you have data, it lets you take something and show that it's working in an evidence-based way. If we don't have data, we know that, well, intuitively, if we bring people to parks, they're probably going to be more successful and they're not going to be host to crime because people are there. But when you have data, you can expand this from just three parks in 2010 to now it officially was announced that it's rolling out to 33 parks in 2018. So imagine the impact this will have countywide on decreasing crime, and it all be is because we transform parks that were otherwise underutilized. It's also important to note that this is getting recognition from one of the world's biggest park and rec associations. The NRPA recently awarded this project a national award winner for innovation. We're <laughs> yeah, that's good, that's good. This is validation that, that parks are valuable, and data lets us measure that and show that in a real way. Because we all know parks are valuable. But now let's see here. We're looking at 14 blue dots that represent 14 of the city of Milwaukee's most underutilized parks in its poorest neighborhoods. These neighborhoods have high obesity rates, crime rates are high. It's very similar to what was happening in the county of Los Angeles. 
City of Milwaukee just started a very impressive public-private partnership called MKE Plays. All of these parks are being redeveloped with public and private dollars. And most importantly, all of these parks are being equipped with sensors and other types of technology that will measure how they get used. So now this is not just a guess and let's hope that in five years we're not redesigning these parks. This is a we're measuring how they're being used today. We're going to design, we're going to create some sort of intervention, and we're going to see how successful that is. We're going to use data on foot traffic. We're going to use data on crime rates. We're going to look at public health. Ultimately, we're going to show that these parks, when rejuvenated, when re-energized, and when they bring people together, are extremely valuable for the neighborhoods that they're in, and they will catalyze change in those neighborhoods. In our research, we looked at the spending in 100 of the U.S. largest cities on parks. What we found was that for every dollar spent on parks, $20 was returned to the economy. This is pretty amazing. But there is a caveat. This doesn't happen in parks that we see in L.A. County that are vacant, that are underutilized. Property values don't go up when people are not using the parks and when they seem unsafe, or they are unsafe. Property values go up, public health increases, healthcare costs go down. When people come together and use the parks, when they're full of recreation opportunities, when they're full of programs and activities that people want to do and come back to do again and again. So I'll leave you with this. Anyone else in the room who is a designer like me has likely read The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces by William H. White. For you, those of you who have not, this is back in the 70s. He sat on rooftops in New York and he studied how people use public urban spaces. What he found, this is not super profound, what attracts people most, it would appear, is other people. So when I think about parks being like Netflix, where they start to care more about how they are getting used, they want to learn how they're being used so that they can do things that are better and better and expose people to more activities that they otherwise wouldn't have known existed, those parks are attracting people and those people are attracting more people. So let's not be afraid of technology. Let's use these three stories for anyone in here who is in Parks and Rec, who cares about their city and neighborhood parks. When we go back to our agencies, to our cities and neighborhoods, these are three stories that I want you to take back that shows that technology and data, when used responsibly, brings people together in parks, and that is the main goal. Thank you.